Hello and welcome to episode 220 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leach. Damien, how are you doing? I'm good now that we've, we've finally done the intro, Andy, because you may not realise this just took us about five attempts because we kept laughing. Um, no, we're good. We're good. I'm good, Andy, thank you. And Lauren's in the background. So we're, we record this in the office and Lauren's in the background laughing at mine and Andy's um, inability to stop laughing at the beginning think, of a podcast. I think they call it corpsing, don't they? When, when, they're try, when they're trying to get a piece out on telly and it just takes ages and you see the producer stressing because yeah. time is money. We need to get Lauren on the podcast actually um, this week. But no, Andy, I'm very good. We've good. been doing so much stuff. We're on social media and mentioning Lauren there. We've just launched the latest episode of Millennial Money on Instagram TV. So Money to the Masses is on Instagram TV, which is exciting in itself. So all good. Good stuff. That's very exciting indeed. We've got lots and lots coming up this week, so I suppose we better crack on with it. What have we got coming up on this week's show? Well, the the first piece is an investment piece. And I think it was last week's episode where I started talking about fund switches and funds to invest in and some of the stats or bits and pieces I look at when I try and choose a fund. And I, I threw it out there and said, if anybody wants me to cover that, because we did it before a long, long, long time ago. In the early days of this podcast, I mentioned it on a, on a show back then if they wanted me to go back through some of that then let me know and somebody did and I'm ashamed that I've actually misplaced their name but whoever that was thank you and we're going to do that today um the other piece is to do with buying a property get on the property ladder something that is particularly relevant to a few people in the money to the masses towers and it's something we've been talking about um writing about in fact this week so we're going to cover that and the final piece is relating to life insurance and again something that came up when we've been talking in the office this week about some of the nuances of taking out life insurance that people don't know and one thing that normally well perhaps will stop you actually be having a successful claim if you have life insurance and the things you shouldn't do. Good stuff. So what are we starting with this week? Let's go with the investment piece because the investment piece and the property piece could be quite meaty. So on the investment piece, people ask what I, I look at. So as I said, last week I was talking about making fund switches and, and in particular unit trusts, but some of this stuff, it relates to investment trusts and ETFs. And in particular, what do I look at in terms of stats on a fund because you get fund fact sheets and for every fund that exists out there the fund manager has to produce this or normally a one to two page piece of paper that covers lots of stuff about what the fund invests in the types of um, holdings it has which companies or bonds whatever the asset is that it invests in the aim of the portfolio and some key stats and some of those are relevant some aren't and there are actually some stats that aren't even shown on that fact sheet so here's just a couple that if I was going to look at a fund and this could be after I've already done a bit of research because I'm quite keen on looking at how a fund performs historically but over particular periods and testing how it works in a downturn or in a rally so you get a feel for really what the fund is investing in rather than just taking the manager's word for it and how it performs you can find out about currency hedging and stuff like that by doing that but these stats are ones you see publicized so I'm going to go through them one of them is alpha now alpha is a number and it's it's a statistical measure of the skill that the manager has at picking the right investment opportunities. Now, it's a number that will usually be, it's quite a low number, you'll normally end up being less than one, but the general principle is the higher the number, the better. So if a fund has a positive alpha number, then that means that the manager is doing something right in generating returns ahead of what you would probably expect, given the returns of the wider market. So So the alpha number can actually dip into the negative? Yeah, you can have have a negative alpha, which means that that the... fund manager is doing something that's detracting from what you would expect on the performance of the overall market. So they're not doing something great. So that's why you get these fund names that sometimes contain that word alpha, because you'll hear them in, in, if you watch Bloomberg or you will see some sort of investment pieces, they will talk about the alpha that people generate. And that is that extra return they should be generating, given what they're doing, if they've got any skill. But like all these things, I don't ever rely on any one measure because they can change over time. It depends on the time frame you look at, and it depends on what you're comparing it to. And and like I say, they do vary. So I tend to look at a number of different measures to see if they all confirm one another, or what's the overall picture. So that's one of them. And then the other is beta. So you can hear these Greek names that they're using, alpha, beta. Beta is a measure of the fund's sensitivity to the general market. Now, 
if you had a, an investment tracker that tracked the FTSE 100, now the index that you're, you measure beta against, because if you have beta, you have to measure it against some form of index. So if you had a FTSE 100 tracker, then it would likely have a beta of 1. So that means if the FTSE goes up by 1%, then in all likelihood, that tracker should go up by 1%. That doesn't always happen with trackers, obviously, because there's costs involved, and sometimes the way they actually sample or actually replicate the FTSE 100 or whatever index they're tracking means there's a loss of performance. But the general idea is that the higher the beta, the more sensitive it is to where the market goes. So if you had a 1, then... Like I said, if the market jumps up by 1%, your fund is likely to. It's going to mirror it, yeah. If you have a zero, then it's not actually doing anything in relation to it. And if you had a negative number, then it means it's going in the opposite, the opposite direction. Right, yeah. Would you ever have a situation where it goes above one? Yeah, so you can have a really high beta. And that's going to mean that your fund is going to be flying if the market goes up. But equally, if the market tanks, it's going to go down. Oh, we it, touched on that last week. Yeah, so it could be a sign of... If you if you saw a fund with a high beta, then one thing it, would, it might suggest is there's a, an element of tracking going on. So it could be a closet tracker. So if the index, when you see a beta of a fund, look at the index it's being related to. So it could be the sector average that it's in. So that just means it's just basically keeping its head down and just mirroring every other fund out there. If it's an index, then if you've got a UK equity fund that's got a beta of one, then it's basically, if it's being benchmarked against a FTSE 100, for example, it's basically a closet tracker. So I'd done research on 8020 Investor before where I was outing closet trackers and managers who were taking charges and being paid to just pretty much give you a tracker fund and an expensive one at that. So beta was one of the things that I used to identify that. But in conjunction with another measure I'll come on to. But as Andy said, the higher the number, the more it's going to be moving or being amplified by amplifying moves in the stock market, which can be a sign of gearing. So if you had investment trust, for example, investment trust can borrow money to invest. So it could be a sign of gearing. The other measure I would look at is general volatility of a fund. Now, volatility is, it can be measured in different ways, but one way is standard deviation. So to think of it, if a fund had a uh, an average return of around 10%. It's a very simple way to think of it. If it had a volatility score of about 15%, that means that on average the range of returns are going to go plus or minus 15% from that middle zone of 10%. So if you've ever seen that kind of bell curve standard deviation model, it just means you can have, a, if the volatility is high, then the possible outcomes can be quite wide from the sort of average of every year. So a very volatile fund means you can have this, if you were to draw it on a piece of paper, it means it's going to zigzag up and down a lot. And so the, depending on when you take your profit or your loss, basically when you close out, it can mean that you could be up or down. Now, some funds will have a higher volatility because of the investments that they hold, like equities versus a bond fund. But it's useful to look at the volatility measure of a fund versus its peer group, because then you get a sign of the sort of level of risk. Because volatility... People say it's not a measure of risk as such because it's a measure of the movement of the price. But in a way, if you're, if a fund is incredibly volatile, the chances of you actually cashing out or making an investment decision, good or bad, is actually higher anyway. So in a, it is a quasi measure of risk it, to a certain extent. So if you take those three together, you're already starting to build up a picture of what a fund's doing. Because if a fund didn't have a particularly good alpha figure, but a high beta figure, and it's very volatile, you're knowing already then that what they're doing is they're either following a really highly leveraged momentum strategy, because momentum has a high beta, or they're basically a, a tracker fund of some kind. So you want to have a look at different measures of these things. If you move on to one of my favourite, now if you can have a favourite fun stat, I don't know if that makes me incredibly sad, but one I will look at almost first of all is Sharpe ratio. And now Sharpe ratio, you don't worry about how they measure these things, how they calculate them, because they're really convoluted statistics. And that's coming from a man who did a maths degree, and they are fairly convoluted if you want to work out how they do it. But what it does is it indicates how much excess return a manager has produced for the increase in volatility. So going back to that last figure, in simple terms, works out how much extra return a manager is generating for the level of risk he or she is taking. So if you think about it, if there were two funds side by side in the same sector, you may think the one that had generated, say, 10% that year might be a better fund to hold than the one that said, say, produced 
8%. But if the one that, that had produced 10% had taken twice as much risk, so therefore it was just as likely if the market had downturned to lose you more money, yeah. which is the better investment? The one that's getting a really good return with lower risk taking, or the one that's giving you a little bit more return, but it's actually taking a lot more risk. Yeah, it's and taking it, more factors into account yeah. and, and sort of smoothing out. And, yeah. So it's actually showing you there's some kind of risk management going on. And investing is all about risk management as well. People think it's all about performance and return. And the, if you just solely focus on return all the time, you will chase performance. And that's where you get increased volatility and you can get caught out. It is about risk management as well, which is a thing that's built into what we do with 8020 Investor. We take the momentum angle, but building risk measures into it to screen things out because you don't want to be getting the wildest ride ever going. I imagine that got his name, Sharp Ratio, because it was named after someone called Mr. Sharp. It probably was, Andy. Because it's sharp with an E, isn't it? It's a sharp with an E. S-H-A-R-P-E ratio. Do you know what? I should look that up. But quite frankly, I just look at the numbers. I'm a numbers man. (laughs) (laughs) And anybody who's met me knows I'm terrible with names anyway, so I I would have forgotten it. R squared. Now, R, the letter R, then the word squared. It's an interesting statistic because it gives a measure of how much a fund's movements can be attributed to the movement of the fund's benchmark. So this gives you a clue as to how relevant the other numbers are that you've been looking at. So to give you um, a scenario, let's say a fund had a high R squared number, and this goes up towards one. So you go, the higher would be 0.85 to one. That would suggest that the fund's performance pattern has been in line with the chosen index. So you can see that if we pick a benchmark for a fund or the index that the fund is following, or we compare it against, that R squared number is important because it gives you a sign that actually it gives you a a clue as whether the benchmark is even relevant because when you compare things, you could be find you're comparing apples and pears. Yeah. So I'll give you a... That's one of the hardest things in whenever I'm doing data analysis is 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 actually working out what I'm comparing against what and if it's relevant. Yeah, because if you take a UK equity fund, if the benchmark you were, you, you were using, you're comparing it against was, um, let's say, the S&P 500, so the US stock market. Now, that won't be a good a comparison for a UK equity fund as the FTSE 100. Because there's a currency element in the S&P 500 and the US stock market by converting it backwards. And it's a different stock market. So what would happen is you could see all these statistics like beta and everything like that and go, oh, it's got a low beta. But R squared can give you a hint as to whether the benchmark that the beta is based upon is any good or not. So to give you an example, if you had a low R squared, so it's under 0.7, that suggests the movement in the fund's performance isn't really in line with the benchmark. So the question then becomes, is that a fact? or is the benchmark you're using the wrong one but given that most funds will obviously choose their own benchmark then you can only go with what they're giving you and sometimes it does bring up the idea is the benchmark the right benchmark they're using anyway but if you use it in conjunction with beta but what you can get is if a fund has a beta less than one and an r squared close to one then that suggests that it's offering high risk adjusted returns so thinking about that low beta means it's not just tracking the market it's not just a tracker it's actually doing its own thing but if the performance was good it's not just following the market but then the r squared means that the actual benchmark is relevant to the fund as well and that's a good thing right that's a good thing yeah because you you will therefore look at the alpha as well and you'll look at the sharp ratio all in conjunction to see because i I, if there was a good sharp ratio and the r squared was relevant and the beta was good i wouldn't necessarily reject a fund just because of the beta but it what it does, it gives you a hint to what the fund is doing. So if the beta is low, or lower than one, you know it's not just following the market, it's not just a tracker. So it shows you that something more is going on. But if the R squared is high, that's showing you that that benchmark is relevant. It's a relevant comparison. It's apples versus apples. But if the performance is way better than the index, and is like that alpha, then you start to think, well, this this fund is doing something. And you see it in added performance and possible lower volatility. So it's combining all of these. But if I was to pick one, I'd go back to that one I said was my favourite, which was the sharp ratio, because I think it's very simple. It just encapsulates the idea that the risk they're taking, are they getting that extra return? Now, another one that I, I also tend to have a quick look at is the max fall figure. Now, it's not widely quoted, and we use it on 8020 Investor. We look at the max fall figure. Uh, figure over a given period of time which can be six months a year whatever you choose I tend to look at around about six months because that's recent history and what it shows you is the maximum amount the fund has fallen in a given week and 
comparing it to other funds out there, it gives you a measure of like in recent history, which is why I tend to focus on say the last six months because fund, funds can change the the underlying assets they hold. So you know, in recent months they won't have changed that much. It can give you an idea that if we get a repeat of a recent sell-off, how's that fund going to perform without you having to look at lots of charts? And if you combine that with a volatility figure, it can give you an idea of like, yeah, do you know what? If if we're going to get a sell-off, like we say we had one recently, then you know you've got an inkling how that fund will probably perform and it may lose more money or drop more than one of its peers which may have a lower max fall number and of course a final thing on this piece which is a given really is performance i will look at performance of a fund recent performance in particular and um, then look at the other statistics after that so i mean that's a quick whistle stop tour of some of the stats that i would look at it's not all all the stats i would look at but it's a very good one if you can find those often they're on a fund fact sheet not always sharp ratios aren't but you can normally find a lot of those if you want to go on something like morningstar they often quote some of those then they're quite good very quick ways of comparing funds Good stuff. And while we've been chatting, I've uh, gone to my good friend Google and found out Sharp Ratio, who it was named after. So this is a learning podcast for you as well as listeners today. The measure was named after William F. Sharp, a Nobel laureate and professor of finance at Stanford University. So there we go. Bill Sharp. Yeah, Billy Sharp. (laughs) I'm glad you weren't listening to a word I was saying while I was talking there, Andy, and you were Googling. Find out how fit your finances are for free with Damien's Money MOT. With no registration required and no need to access policies or paperwork, you'll receive your own personal grade, together with a breakdown of where you should focus your attention, all in the time that it takes to boil the kettle. Crucially, you'll get to see how you measure up compared to everyone else, and even get your own tailored plan on how to improve your score. Simply go to mot.moneytothemasses.com to sit back, relax, take Damien's free money MOT, go to mot moneytothemasses.com to get started and reward yourself with that cup of tea afterwards good stuff what we got next so next we're going on to the property get on the property ladder which is a conversation we seem to have regularly within the office and with millennial money viewers because everybody seems to be obsessed with getting on the property ladder but one thing that we agreed upon when we looked at this was that there was so much stuff out there in terms of schemes and help and initiatives that it's a minefield and people didn't even know what you could what, what they were if you go and look at the official government websites it's not even completely clear as the alternative because there's lots of caveats to lots of these different schemes so what we thought we'd do is give a very brief overview of some of the help that's out there for people and then we can obviously link through to it we did an article this week basically didn't we on first-time buyers and the help that they can get so go and find that on the website Andy will link through to that but for now we're going to go quickly rattle through a number of those points yeah so we're looking at first-time buyers specifically in this and actually as we talk about first-time buyers we we come across some other little bits of caveats where actually some of these schemes are actually designed where you don't have to be a first-time buyer which is quite handy because I'm one of those people Incidentally, did you know, Damien, what the average age of a first-time buyer is now? Because I wrote an article today, which I had to do a bit of research on that. Do I win anything? No, you don't win anything, but it's, I thought it was interesting. 38? No, it's actually a lot less than that. It's 30. <laughs> 30? Yeah. I was going to say, I hope you're going to tell me, it would be a terrible podcast as I just go, <laughs> as I just slowly go to count down from 38 to 30. Okay, well, I thought that was um, about right, maybe a bit lower than I thought. I thought it was maybe 32, 33, but it is 30 apparently, but it is no, undoubtedly going to be creeping up as it becomes more difficult to buy. But there are schemes that can help first-time buyers. So we're going to run through those quickly now. The first one I wanted to cover is the Help to Buy ISA. So the Help to Buy ISA is actually going to be discontinued later on this year. The initial date that's been given is the 30th of November. I mean, it's still available. It still is a viable scheme, but it's been superseded really by something called the Lifetime ISA, which we'll cover in a second. So the Help to Buy ISA is basically an ISA. So that's a wrapper. Uh, you like to describe it as like a tax wrapper. Yeah, a wrapper. I, I got told off by Justin for using the word wrapper. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about a box. It's basically a box like an ISO. It's something that you put things in, which whether it be, in this case, it has to be cash. Help to buy ISOs have to be cash. And you don't pay any tax on the interest or growth. That's it. Cash ISA. So what you do is you save your money up each month. I'll go through the figures. So you can put £200 a month into a help to buy ISA and the 
Brucey bonuses, the government will put 25% in as well. So they'll top it up for you. To start things off, you can put £1,200 in, but then it's £200 per month. And you can get a maximum bonus from the government. So that's that 25% kicker that they give you. You get a maximum bonus of £3,000. So to keep things really simple, the maximum you can save really in a help to buy ISA overall is £12,000. And the government will put in three thousand pounds on top of that and then that's it done you can then use that to buy or put towards your first home so there's a couple of caveats obviously with these things there always are caveats um about the size of the house isn't there the house is yeah see the property needs to be two hundred and fifty thousand pounds or less outside of greater london if you're inside of greater london or the the london boroughs you can have a property up to the total price of 450,000 there's age restrictions as well you need to be over 16 which actually is quite low you would expect it maybe to be 18 but you can actually be 16 years and over and be putting money into this and a UK resident yeah and so we're going to move on to the lifetime ISA now so we can talk about this is the one that's probably going to be more relevant to most people out there help to buy in a nutshell is one that would be particularly interesting to people who have got a small regular amount they want to save the frustration with the help to buy isa has always been that you couldn't put a big lump sums in as in an ad hoc fashion because there are limits but you've got that and that monthly limit the other thing to quickly mention on the help to buy is that the bonus isn't paid regularly the bonus is paid once you go and buy a house so you will be saving away and you will get the bonus once you try and buy it there had been issues with people that didn't realise the timing of when they get that bonus, which is when they buy the house. They're not going to get the money to pay the solicitor, for example, before they even get the house, which some people have come on stuck on. So now we jump on to lifetime ISAs. The lifetime ISA is, we're going to dwell on it because there are obviously caveats and um, age restrictions on it, which you can find out in our post. But a lifetime ISA is quite simply works slightly differently. You can put lump sums into it. There's a four grand limit a year which you get the 25% bonus on. When you work out the numbers, that would be a grand a year, which is pretty good. It's free money. That's why these things are popular. There are age restrictions, like I said, 18 to 40. But the difference is that the bonus is actually paid as you go along. It ends up being monthly, but you can't buy a house within a year. So that is a restriction. If you want to buy a house within a year, then you can't put money in a lifetime ISA and get the bonus and run. You've actually got to wait a year before you can use it. Obviously, because you get the bonus as you go along, if you take the money out before you buy a house, then they actually tax you. They hit you with a 25% penalty. And that can work mean that you can get less than you put in if you work out the, the numbers. Now, one of the things with a lifetime ISO is it can be used for retirement saving. That was the whole thing the government came up with. They said, let's make something that isn't just restricted to property. Let's make it so we can use it as a form of flexible pension saving. So you can use it as a pension instead going forward. So if you don't buy a house, all's not lost. You can keep saving into it and they'll keep paying a bonus up to the age of 50, I believe, Andy. That's correct. And then that will be, you can use the money to as a, as a form of retirement saving. The other key difference with a help to buy and a, li- and a lifetime ISA, help to buy had to be cash and therefore you couldn't have a cash ISA and a help to buy ISA. A lifetime ISA can be a stocks and shares ISA as well as a cash ISA. They're different versions. So it means you can have a lifetime ISA and a cash ISA. It all has to be within that £20,000 limit even though there's only a £4,000 limit on a lifetime ISA. Now, like I said, we go through all of this on the post online, but the takeaway is that a lifetime ISA, it's free money, effectively, if you're planning on saving anyway, and you're not going to buy a house within a year, and if you're paying regular or lump sum amounts, it's quite attractive. It's more attractive than a help to buy ISA. A key thing is on that lifetime ISA as well, is if you're over 40 you've lost your chance. So if you're under the age of 40 and you think it's something that may interest you, even if you've bought your first property and you you think about pensions and stuff, start one up. Even just put £1 a month in because once you've started that up, you've got it then and then you've got the option to, to put more in when you're older. And I can just almost hear some of you asking the question out there, can you have both? Can you have a help to buy ISA and a lifetime ISA? And theoretically you can, but you can only use the bonus from one of them to buy a house. So it it begs the question as to why you would do it. And then I just heard another question on the airwaves there. Someone thinking, if I inherit a house, can I use a lifetime ISA? You're hearing a lot. Your perception is amazing today. (laughs) I'm hearing voices. I'm not sure that's a good thing for my mental health. But yes, you can. If If there was a scenario where you inherited a house, say, from your parents and 
you, you're therefore thinking, can I use my lifetime ISA to buy the house I actually want? Because you might not want the house you inherit. You can as long as you don't technically put your your name doesn't go on the land registry as owning that house. So if the house passes to you, but it's as it passes to you, it's sold, so it's never in your name and you inherit the cash, then you can still use your lifetime ISA and qualify as a first-time buyer under the first-time buyer rules. Right. On to the next schemes. Good stuff. So there's just a couple of other schemes to cover. You've got the help to buy equity loan. So it sounds very similar to help to buy ISA, but it is very different. The help to buy equity loan is the government essentially giving you a 20% interest-free loan towards the purchase price of your property. So to keep things really simple, if there was a £100,000 property that you were interested in, the government will cover you for the 20,000. You can get an interest-free loan for 20,000. You'd put down generally a deposit of 5,000 and then you're left to get the other 75,000 as part of a mortgage. The crucial thing here is you don't pay interest for five years on that 20% loan that you've got with the government. So it's, it's really a way to be able to reduce the overall amount of a mortgage that you're applying for to make it more affordable for first-time buyers. There's a few caveats to that. After five years, if you've still got that 20% loan with the government, that's kind of fine, but you will pay a 1.75% interest on that, which actually isn't too bad when you come to think of it. Now, what What's in it for the government? Why are they giving you £20,000 interest free? Well, the idea is that after five years or however long, you'll eventually sell that property and they effectively are due 20% of any proceeds from the sale of the house. Oh, and I should mention that the help to buy the equity loan is available for new build properties only. There's also something called shared ownership scheme or share to buy scheme. It's called one or the other. And that is a scheme where you don't own the whole house. So you'll be given an option to own a percentage of the property, normally in multiples of 10, so 40, 50, 60%. And the other proportion of the property is owned normally by a housing association and you will pay a rent to them and an administration charge so to keep things really simple you go for a hundred thousand pounds property you'd get a fifty thousand pound mortgage and fifty thousand pounds of that property is, is owned by the housing association and you'll pay rent on that now there's things you can do to own the whole property in time you can staircase and that's where in time as you become more affluent affluent Thank you, Damien. You can apply to own more of your property by remortgaging and taking a bit more back. So it's a way of getting on that ladder. And then slowly but surely, as your finances get into the the perfect position, you'll eventually own that house outright. Be careful on the leasehold and freehold side of things. Not going to get into it now. Check out the article, but there's a few nuances with that. The maximum purchase price for that help to buy equity loan is £600,000 and it must be your only residence. Right, on to the last one. On, before we do that one, isn't there an earnings limit? Yes, you need to have combined earnings of £80,000 or less. Otherwise, you don't qualify. Essentially, they see you... You blow the doors off. Yeah. They think you're too rich. They think you're house. too rich for that. You don't need, to, you don't need help. <laughs> yeah. The last one, start a home scheme. Now, there's not much information about this. This is a new scheme. You need to be aged between 23 and 40. It's for first-time buyers, and you will qualify for 20% off the purchase price of a new home if you qualify for this scheme. You'll need to go on to the website and have a look at it because there's not much information yet. It's a new scheme for everyone, it seems, and uh, yeah, just keep an eye on it. And I'll pop a link to that scheme on the show notes. So... There are a number of schemes that you that are out there. Two final points that other things that are that are happening in the world. You see, bank of mum and dad is always going to be one of the best and most popular routes to buying a house and owning a house out there. And there are a number of mortgage products out there that are made, facilitating that a bit better. So whereby we talked to it on the pop about the podcast before. So go and have a look through the feed. But there are companies out there. I know Barclays did one where you could use your, a parent could put their savings. Lock it away in a Barclays savings account. So reducing the loan to value for their offspring who are trying to buy a house and getting them a better deal. There are nuances of it, but you can find details out there. And there are other people doing it. And the other thing just to mention on the schemes that we talked about, bear in mind there are some scare stories out there whereby these these schemes that have helped house builders build enormous profits because they obviously can put properties up for a slightly inflated amount because if you're going to buy one with a bit of help from the government as long as you get a property you're not really worried too much about the price of it so there have been cases where people have bought houses that are at overinflated prices and where and then when they've tried to sell them subsequently not long after they find they are actually in quite a bit of negative equity so you just have to be mindful of the true value of the house that you are buying anyway on to the last piece the last piece is life insurance and we wanted to focus on particularly when you're applying for life insurance and 
and what you need to sort of keep in mind. Yeah, we there were a few pieces that came out this week about the claims levels for different insurance companies. So the amount of uh, the percentage of cases where somebody had put a claim in for a death case or income protection and how many the percentage that had paid out, which always makes for interesting reading and is surprisingly high. I think if people were to guess the payout rate for lots of insurers, they'd probably sit there and think it was 50-60%, but actually it's 93%. And me and Andy were talking about one, and he he actually described one of them that was about 93% as not very good, which I thought was quite incredible, really. So that's the good news that insurance companies do pay out. But one of the reasons they don't, the biggest reason they don't, is for non-disclosure, which means that you didn't disclose something that was wrong with you during the process. So you signed up and you may have had some health issue you didn't mention, whether that was on purpose or by mistake, then when you make a claim that you can't work or you die and your family make a claim for the fact you've died, the insurance company goes, oh, hold on a second, you didn't tell us about that. That invalidates this claim and this policy. You get your premiums back, nothing more, and that's it. Now, the moral of this story is the importance of disclosing everything. Now, I open about the fact I have Crohn's. So when I went for life insurance, Trying to remember everything that's ever happened to me relating to my Crohn's is in- incredible. If you saw my, they ask for dates as well, which is which is always hard. I mean, I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast yesterday, let alone what happened four or five years ago. The thing is, if you saw my medical records and I had the pleasure of seeing them once, if you dropped them on your foot, it would break it. <laughs> they are they are about a foot deep, and um, trying to remember all of that or anything that happened in there is too much. So. People, when they go for life insurance, think it's going to take ages. They're going to write to my doctor. I just want to get it on risk. And what we, and I say on risk, that means the policy starts. So they want to get it started. The thing is, when I did my life insurance, I said, speak to my doctor, speak to my doctor. It delays the application process. But as Andy and I were talking about, what people don't realize, as soon as you apply for, say, life insurance, you are covered for the amount you've applied for from the moment you started to apply for it. So even though it might take somebody weeks months even it can do in the worst case but usually it's not that long maybe a couple of weeks to write to your doctor for your doctor to be bothered to write back to the insurance company to give them the detail and they give you a decision it is getting quicker nowadays because of technology because of digital records what used to happen is dr smith used to have to with his fountain pen have to diligently write out all all the answers to the questions now systems are set up where they press print and put it into an envelope that's literally what and they do get paid for it which is in fact i don't even think they put it in an envelope now i think it gets sent electronically Absolutely, that's why it should happen. So that, to me, is the why you should why you should always disclose anyway. Because if you want your policy to pay out, you should disclose. But get them to if you can't remember or unsure, tell them to write to your doctor. Just ask them. Yeah, and they'll, they'll have to do it. Honestly, just ask them to write to your doctor. And that means you'll always get paid out. There won't be any problems. But the more importantly, you're still going to be covered. You don't have to worry about the delay. You won't be paying premiums, by the way, during this period. It's like free cover because they're assuming that you will eventually be covered. Of course, your premium could go up like mine does because of my Crohn's disease. But that's an inevitability. Unfortunately, that's because of your health criteria, your health Surely conditions. you'd rather be paying a few extra pounds a month knowing that you're fully covered yeah. than paying a cheap premium on a policy that you'll never be covered for. Yeah. So the idea of just trying to keep your premiums cheap by getting the lowest premium by not mentioning something is foolish because you might not get paid out. Because don't forget, if you die... They're going to find out why you died. So the uh, the moral of this story and is always... And it won't be you that's left to pick up the pieces. It'll be your poor family that en- yeah. en- fi- end up finding out you're not covered. Yeah, so always disclose and always request, if you want to, that you, they write to your doctor because then you're guaranteed to have full disclosure. And like I said, you may pay more premium, but you're always going to have to pay more premium if you've got something wrong with you. Otherwise, you've invalidated the policy. That was a bit of a, uh, serv- oh. a customer service announcement. Great stuff. So we rattled through that slightly longer one this week. We are done. Um, just to quickly mention, of course, the Mug Hall of Fame. That is going at great pace. We have given out some mugs already. We'll be doing some more mug giveaways on this podcast. You need to make sure that you do something mug worthy. So please do get in touch with us. Tell us what you want to hear about. Give us a subject to talk about. Tell us something we're doing great. Some, tell us something we're doing terribly. You probably won't win a mug for that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely won't if I, <laughs> if I have anything to say about it. So that is Damien at moneytothemasses.com. You can contact me. It's Andy at moneytothemasses.com. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, please do share the love and review the podcast. Yeah, and until next week. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Play. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how. <laughs>